Michael A. Poole is a senior lecturer in environmental studies and Paul Doherty is a lecturer in history, philosophy, and politics at the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. This 1997 article presents some of the key findings from their 1996 book on ethnic segregation in Belfast, Northern Ireland. This article is important because it highlights the fact that ethnicity can be defined in various ways, including religion as well as with poorly defined concepts such as race. Doherty and Poole also grapple with the classic chicken and egg problem of whether violence causes segregation or segregation causes violence. Doherty and Poole, the authors of this article, grew up in Northern Ireland, so they have the perspective of insiders when it comes to understanding what are usually just called the Troubles with a capital T that have long affected the people living there. However, most people have at least some familiarity with the situation. What we usually hear about Northern Ireland is that the Protestants and the Catholics there seem to have a lot of mutual distrust and dislike and that historically from time to time this has even spilled over into violence and bloodshed. What troubles have to do with cities as social contexts and in particular with the topic of relations between ethnic groups and urban life? Question, we can ask another. Is the conflict between Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland actually a religious conflict? For example, arguing over theological issues such as the infallibility of the Pope or the ordination of women as priests? While doctrinal issues do separate Protestants and Catholics, these religious questions have virtually nothing to do with the conflicts in Belfast and the rest of Northern Ireland. Of the Irish Troubles, we must go back over 300 years into the past and look at the contacts between Ireland and England over all those centuries. The Rural Agricultural Society of Ireland preserved many aspects of the ancient Gaelic culture that existed in all the British Isles before the repeated waves of different ethnic peoples swept into them from continental Europe, and in particular before the coming of the Anglo-Saxons to England. The most important date for understanding Irish troubles today remains the year 1690. The Catholic King James of England had been deposed by his Protestant son-in-law William and daughter Mary, who have a college in Virginia named for them. King James fled to Catholic Ireland to raise an Irish army to help him try to recapture the English crown. But William, who was also the Prince of Orange, a Dutch royal title, brought his Scottish, Dutch, and English army to Ireland instead and crushed James and his Irish recruits at the Battle of the Boyne River that summer. This victory cemented English colonial control over Ireland and England continued the practice of resettling large numbers of Scottish Highlanders as well as English farmers in Irish territory to gradually take over control of the island. Protestant settlers imported from Scotland eventually became known as the Scots-Irish, and many of their descendants eventually migrated again to the southern United States. But conflict continued for all the following centuries between the Irish Catholics who had been in the island for centuries and the Protestant settlers imported by the English to pacify and control the countryside. The conflict is not about theology, it's about rival claims over territory. It is a classic example of ethnic groups in conflict. We're used to thinking about ethnicity as just another word for race, whatever that might be, but the word actually has nothing to do with any physiological characteristics. An ethnic group is bound together by some kind of shared social heritage, not biology. This common ground can be a religion, as with Catholics and Protestants, or it can be a language, as with the French and English speakers in Canada, or it can be simply a shared history of movement and settlement as a group. Over these centuries, the Catholics, who also call themselves Republicans because they would like to see the independent Republic of Ireland control the whole island, have been contending with the Protestants, who also call themselves Loyalists because they see themselves as loyal to the King or Queen of England, who also rules Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. The Protestants are greatly outnumbered by the Catholics in the island, and over the centuries most of them have retreated north to the few counties of Northern Ireland that are still part of Great Britain, outside the territory of the Irish Republic. In Northern Ireland, considered by itself, the Protestants are a clear majority of the population. A few Protestants remain inside the Irish Republic today.
capital city of Northern Ireland, Belfast, is the subject of study for Doherty and Poole. Against the backdrop of the concentration of Protestants in Northern Ireland, the city of Belfast has remained a mixture of Catholics and Protestants. Grudges and rivalries are celebrated and preserved down through the centuries, and the two ethnic groups, often using religion as their official markers to tell each other apart, have a stormy and sometimes violent relationship up to the present day. The result of all this history, that is relevant for Doherty and Poole, is a pattern of residential segregation within the city of Belfast. As the city grew in population size, it also followed the standard pattern of spreading out into a larger area. As in so many other places, this process of deconcentration intensified a pattern of sorting out of the population into Catholic neighborhoods and Protestant neighborhoods. Even segregated in different parts of the city, the two sides still find ways to torment each other. Every year, for example, the Protestants dress up and carry orange flags through the streets in a huge parade celebrating the old 1690 battle, taking care to march through streets that go as close as possible to important Catholic neighborhoods. This almost never fails to stir up trouble. So the issue of Protestants against Catholics in Northern Ireland really involves the uneasy relations between two ethnic groups who happen to define themselves mostly in terms of religion but who are separated by a shared history of sometimes violent political competition. Doherty and Poole consider this seemingly endless struggle between the two sides in terms of how it shapes the character and residential patterns of the city of Belfast. They open a sociological window into one small glimpse of the longer history of coexistence between the two groups as residents of one city. The central question that Doherty and Poole hope to answer by looking at residential patterns in Belfast, concerns the link between political violence and segregation. On one hand, it is possible that violence may lead to segregation, because both sides in a conflict will try to get away from the danger of living among their enemies. Relying on old sayings like birds of a feather flock together, or there's safety in numbers, Catholics may move together and create Catholic neighborhoods, while Protestants do the same for themselves, creating a pattern of segregation. On the other hand, though, people who live in isolated, segregated neighborhoods will have less and less contact with and less and less knowledge about the people on the other side over time. This decline in familiarity and understanding can lead to growing fear and prejudice, exaggerating the faults of the people in the opposing group and the dangers that they are thought to pose. It is the old riddle of which comes first, the chicken or the egg, the segregation or the prejudice and conflict. In Belfast, the situation had gotten so extreme that the authorities even had to build what they called peace walls between neighborhoods when a concentrated Catholic area was particularly close to a concentrated Protestant neighborhood. These walls cut down to some extent on the riots and gun battles that sometimes erupted where the walls now stand, but to urban scholars they look surprisingly like a throwback to the internal walls that separated the different quarters of many ancient pre-industrial cities. Before Doherty and Poole can do any clear and objective analysis to answer their central question, they first must find some kind of precise way to measure the pattern of segregation in the city. It is not enough to locate a few peace walls. We need a pattern of segregation. We need measurements that describe the residential patterns of the entire city and all the people living in it. To do this, they adopt some common measures of residential segregation, one called the index of dissimilarity, represented by the letter D, and another called the separation index, with additional letters such as C for Catholics and P for Protestants. They calculate values of each index using information from three censuses of Northern Ireland, taken in 1971, 1981, and 1991, as ethnic conflict ebbed and flowed in the territory. Each calculation starts with one of over 150 squares of a grid that covered the city of Belfast and its suburbs, and compares the numbers of Protestants and Catholics living inside that grid square. Each square covers one square kilometer, about a third of a square mile. Although they say that these squares are 100 meters on each side on one page, 
On the next page, they say the squares are each a square kilometer, so clearly the 100 meters is a typo, and nobody noticed that a zero was missing before this article was published. After they do these calculations for each of the squares in their grid, which they claim are similar to census tracts in U.S. cities, they combine these squares into eight larger areas that roughly match the major administrative sections of the city, shown on the map in their article. These larger areas are similar to the zip code areas that you will use for your own group projects, but Doherty and Poole start from calculations for many more, much smaller sub-areas. For both their measures of dissimilarity and of isolation, they discover that numerical values increased over time. This indicates increasing segregation of Catholics from Protestants. Since you will be calculating these same index values as part of your own original research project, we will spend a little time spelling out how they are constructed. Once you know exactly where such an index value comes from, you'll have a much better sense of what they mean and what they tell us about the people in this city. The index of dissimilarity, or d-index, always takes a value someplace between 0 and 1. A value of 0 means no dissimilarity at all, or no segregation. A value of 1.0 means total dissimilarity, or total separation and segregation. To see how the index works, we'll consider three examples. A case that produces a value of 0, another that produces a value of 1, and a third case that falls somewhere more normal in between. Consider a city divided into three sub-areas, called place 1, place 2, and place 3 in the table shown here. The numbers in the table could be thousands of residents or whatever you like. These residents are divided between two different ethnic groups, Group A and Group B. Group A is a small minority and Group B is the majority. This is true in the city as a whole and also within each of the three places. Dissimilarity here is not about the absolute size of the groups, but rather about how they are each spread out across the three places. To see this distribution by place, we divide each part of group A by the total in that group to see what percentage of the total group lives in each place. We do the same thing for group B to see how they are distributed across the three places. You can see that place 3 is by far the largest part of the city. The two sets of row percentages also show us that the distribution of the two groups is actually identical across the three places. This is what will give the d-index a value of 0. To calculate the actual index, we start by subtracting all the percentages for group B from all the percentages for group A. In this case, it's easy because the differences are 0. Next, we take the absolute value of all these differences in the bottom row of the table. All negative numbers become positive, but this has no effect on all our zeros. Finally, we add up all the absolute values in the bottom row and then divide the sum by 2. And the answer is defined as the index of dissimilarity. In this case, it has a value of 0, which means that group A and group B are not segregated from each other at all in this city, at least when it comes to living in place 1 versus places 2 or 3. In the second example, we have the same places and the same groups A and B. But this time, all of group B is split between the first two places and all of group A is found in only place 3. The totals are still the same. This time the row percentages still add up to 100% for each group, but they no longer line up in the columns of the three different places. When we subtract to find the differences, we find two negative 50% and one positive 100%. Notice that these still cancel each other out if you just add up the differences, and the result is still zero. But if we take absolute values, the negatives no longer cancel out the positive percentage, and they all add up to 200%, 100 from each of the two groups. When we divide this result by 2, we get 100%. This means the d-index has a value of 1.0, and the two groups are totally segregated from each other in different places within the city. Finally, we have a hybrid example, taking the group A distribution from the second, totally segregated case, but the group B distribution from the first totally unsegregated case. Naturally, the row of percentages for group A is also the same as the percentages from the segregated example. 
the row of percentages for group B is the same as the percentages from the first unsegregated example. This time when we do our subtractions we again get some negative and some positive values and again they just cancel each other out and still sum to zero. But when we take the absolute values nothing cancels out and all the differences add up in the same direction. We get a total of 80%. When we divide this by 2 this time we get 40% or 0.4 for the value of the index of dissimilarity. How can we interpret this number? The simplest way to think about the d-index is that it tells us what share of either group would have to move to different places in the city in order to even out all the percentages and produce a score of zero. In this case, either 40% of group A could move over to places 1 and 2, or 40% of group B could move to place 3, and we would get equal percentages and a score of zero. It doesn't matter which group moves. The d-index only tells us how far away the groups are from such a zero score and from being equally distributed across the city. To calculate d-index scores for Belfast, Doherty and Poole start at the smaller scale of square kilometer grids and then work up to larger areas. But the calculations they did are exactly the same as what we have just reviewed. They also discuss another measure called the isolation index, which is calculated separately for each group considered using a different approach. These measures tell us the chance if a member of one group goes outside and encounters another person at random within their ward, that the two of them will belong to the same ethnic group. The higher this index, the more likely that the person will only encounter others of the same ethnic group. The results of analysis by Doherty and Poole give us a classic picture of a city increasingly segregated by ethnicity. Even though people in Belfast have created an ethnic distinction based on religion rather than race, the observed level of segregation there is at about the same level as the segregation between blacks and whites observed in many U.S. cities. Once such divisions have been created in human societies, they appear to serve as effective foundations for prejudice, fear, and discrimination, no matter what they choose as external markers of identity. In the first table of results in the article, we see figures from three successive census counts in Northern Ireland, including 1971, 1981, and 1991. Over that 20-year period, the percentages of Catholics in the city increased slightly, from a little over 27% to just over 31%, still below a third of the total population. So Catholics are the ethnic minority in Belfast, just as they are in most of Northern Ireland. As Doherty and Poole describe so clearly, Belfast was shrinking throughout these two decades. So this means that the city as a whole was losing Protestants faster than Catholics as people abandoned the city, causing the percent Catholic to rise among those remaining behind. In the second column of this table, we also see that the index of dissimilarity increased, mostly between 1971 and 1981, when it grew by almost 10 percentage points, but also again by 1991, when it was actually above 60%. This means that almost two-thirds of all the Catholics or Protestants in the city would have to move to different areas to even out the two distributions and delete segregation among areas. The isolation index tells a similar story, but from a different angle. An average Catholic in the city had about a 50-50 chance that the next person he or she would meet would be another Catholic in 1971. But by 1991, the chance that next person met would be another Catholic rose to 61%. The isolation index for Protestants was much higher and held steady across the decades, with more than an 80% chance that a Protestant would encounter another Protestant rather than a Catholic on the street. The isolation index value is lower for Catholics because there are so many more Protestants in the city as a whole. No matter where they live, there are going to be some Protestants around. There are more Protestant neighborhoods with few or no Catholic residents, partly because there are simply fewer Catholics to go around. Doherty and Poole present a series of several graphs in Figure 2 for different areas of the city, 
showing the change in population, the change in the percent Roman Catholic, and the change in the index of dissimilarity within each area based on their data from the smaller one kilometer square grids. In most of the graphs, the line for population trends downward, reflecting the exodus out of Belfast overall. Only Lisburn shows any population increase, although Newtown Abbey was just about holding its own on population. The other two lines in each graph, showing the percent Catholic and the index of dissimilarity within each area, present different trends depending on whether an area is in the Catholic western part of the city or the Protestant eastern part. In the most segregated Roman Catholic area, Belfast West, the population declined while the percent Catholic increased. This must mean that Protestants were moving out of Belfast West faster than Catholics, escaping from a polarized situation where they were the outnumbered minority. On the other hand, in the most segregated Protestant areas, such as Belfast East and Castlereagh, the population decline must have been Catholics moving out faster than Protestants, because the D-index values in those Protestant-dominated areas of the city also rose dramatically. In general, then, we can think of selective out-migration out of Belfast neighborhoods as the main factor producing changes in the index of dissimilarity of residential distributions between Protestants and Catholics in the city. This process unfolded differently in different parts of the city, but in most cases led to increasing concentration of Catholics in Catholic neighborhoods and increasing concentration of Protestants in Protestant neighborhoods. The D-index rose as a result of this increasing segregation, increasing isolation for Catholics while maintaining a high degree of isolation for Protestants within their neighborhoods. So what can we conclude from these figures about which comes first, the chicken or the egg, the segregation or the violence? Doherty and Poole show us that the D-index increased much faster during the 1970s than during the 1980s. This goes together with the fact that there was much more violence and bloodshed in the streets of the city during the 1970s than in the 1980s. So the faster rise of the D-index during the 1970s might be taken as evidence that violence leads to segregation and that people were voting with their feet and trying to cluster together with their own co-religionists in order to stay out of harm's way. There is less evidence in this article that increased segregation itself leads back to more violence. If that were the case, then the rapid rise of segregation and D-index values by 1981 should have foretold further increases in violence during the following decade. But in fact, the violence actually tapered off in the 1980s, even though the city was more segregated along religious lines than ever before.